They want a wonga. What kind of valiant teeth be? <laughs> What's up, Mena Nerds? This video will be the complete life story of Bib Fortuna, with added context and all the expanded universe material from both canon and legends. When the two timelines do diverge, I will put a logo on screen to differentiate. We will follow his life from a boy born into a world of crime, drugs, and corruption, using his incredibly sharp mind to carve out a place for himself in the galaxy, rise to be second in command to the greatest of crime bosses, become a warlord and slaver, turn down a chance at salvation, all while secretly plotting to take the throne, and believe it or not, to save Ryloth. The exact year of Bib Fortuna's birth is unknown, but given that Twi'lex aged at about the same rate of humans, and he seems like he's in his 50s or 60s, we can say that it was around 55 BBY. He would be raised on his species homeworld of Ryloth, but in his teens he would be drawn into the life of crime. For tens of thousands of years, the Twi'lek species were targeted as slaves by numerous alien societies across the galaxy. And this problem was made worse by the chemical makeup of their homeworld as Ryloth was one of the best sources of the drug Spice. At a young age, Bib was caught up in the transport of Rill, which was a popular form of Spice that took its name from Ryloth. Rill could be processed into a variety of forms of legal, medicinal drugs, but it was infamous for being combined with another Spice, Glitter Stem, turning it into Glitter Rill, a process that involved feeding this Spice to energy spiders, which excreted the deadly new drug that was sought out everywhere from the hottest clubs on Coruscant, to the backwater cantinas of the Outer Rim. And to compound these temptations for a young Bib, his own family had given into the spice trade, with his parents, aunts, and uncles all being involved in a smaller scale crime family. The Fortunas surely encouraged him to go into the family business, known as the Una clan, the word Una in Twi'leki meaning graceful. And it was a clan that was also home to Ob, Beezer, and Comad. More on them later. The young Bib Fortuna was just one of millions whose futures were robbed by the failings of his forefathers, and the machinations of politicians and crime bosses, with Black Sun, Hutt families, and the Pike syndicates all working with senators to grow a multi-billion credit market. In fact, Quinlan Voss and then Padawan Ayla Sakura, a fellow Twi'lek, were once drugged with Glitteril by Senator Cham Frey Ka, as one of its side effects was to destroy the user's short-term memory. While so many powerful people kept the spice trade booming, the lower level players like Bib were destroyed by this game. All while official sources like even the Coruscant Census stating that the major exports of Ryloth were real, slaves, and spice in that order. An incredibly dark insight into the economic conditions Bib grew up in. While to the outside many people saw Twi'lex as people synonymous with complacency with crime and the spice trade, their on-planet government did try to take a hard stance on the drugs, and when Bib was found partaking in the business that was destroying their people, they banished him off of his homeworld. But this did not work to save the young man. Fortuna had already gotten a taste for crime, seen how his ability to understand logistics secured great profits, and how he could remain calm and actually manipulate dangerous and capricious criminals. He knew he was smarter than the rest, and that he would spend the rest of his life in the underworld. But right after being exiled, he would take his special set of skills to an unlikely place, the planet Kuat. Home to the galaxy's greatest shipwright, he would come into the employ of Kuat Drive Yards, though not for long. His bosses may have been corrupt, but they grew weary of working with this outright criminal. And they were cunning too, smart enough to detect Bib Fortuna's manipulations to try and rise within KDY. They weren't the dull-witted, spice-addled minds of smugglers that he was used to working with. So Bib quickly found himself exiled again, being escorted off-world in order to never return to Kuat. Now banned from two worlds and still in his 20s, he decided to do some freelance work lending his mind to wealthy spice smugglers, being a consultant that was able to grow the crime businesses of several individuals before this tail-headed savant gained the attention of Jabba Dasilajek to Yor. In the mid-30s BBY, Jabba was attempting to wrestle control of Tatooine from his hut rival, Gardula. He thought that Bib's skills could help him develop a better strategy, one that would eventually have Jabba aligning with Darth Plagueis, or at least with the Mune's public persona as Magister Higo Damask II, representative of the intergalactic banking clan. Bib Fortuna was likely the data collector who learned of Gardula's ties to the Bando Gora terrorist group, and how they worked with the King of Naboo to try and kill Higo Damask. And he also uncovered the plot of the Poison Death Sticks, which had a mind control chemical that would draw members to the dark side cult of Count Dooku's fallen apprentice, a human female named Kamari Vosa. 
All of this info was incredibly important to Plagueis slash Higo Damask, and the secret Sith aided in Jabba's effort to take power from Gardula. In this same year, in 32 BBY, Jabba would be seen at the Bunta Eve Classic pod race, Bib Fortuna right at his side, though not yet officially with the title of Major Domo. It would be shortly after this that Jango would eliminate Gardula, and Jabba was officially the Crime Lord of Tatooine, and one of the most powerful bosses in the underworld. He knew Bib was an invaluable asset, granting the exiled Twi'lek an incredible amount of credits and power. With this, he would return to his homeworld to punish the people that rejected him. With a private army, he waged an all-out invasion of seven different cities on Ryloth. The weakness and corruption of that government that had once exiled him was exposed to the people with this campaign. Though he did want to show their hypocrisy, he didn't do so good for his own reputation. He took most of the populations of those cities hostage and sold them into slavery, the proceeds going to his boss Jabba. He of course also made a pretty credit off of this, and even took some Twi'lek slaves for himself. When inspecting the captives, he realized he had Ayla Sakura's cousin, Nat, and that he had captured his own mother. The young Nat Sakura would be detained for Bib's future goal of taking over Ryloth completely, hoping to torture or manipulate Nat into compliance, and eventually advocacy for Bib as the dictator of the Twi'lek people, knowing his people loved and respected the honorable clan Sakura. Meanwhile, Bib's own mother was cursing his name. She wasn't a crime family herself, but she could not believe that Bib would kill and enslave his own people. Her tirade could not be stopped, but he would not be belittled in front of Jabba's men so he raised his blaster and killed his own mother. Bib Fortuna had not only turned against the Twi'lek species, but his own family, and it was in this Blitzkrieg on Ryloth that brought the Twi'lek dancers and this human dancer named Jess into the audience of the palace. Shortly after this, Fortuna would catch wind of a transport that crashed on its way leaving Tathomir. It crash landed on Tatooine while transporting a Rancor, an enormous beast that was sought out by fighting pits across the galaxy. He knew that Jabba would love to have something that only the most elite of gambling centers could afford, a monster that would also serve as a great way to intimidate any visitors, and dispose of any dissidents. At this time, there was another prized advisor within Jabba's inner circle, a human named Bidlo Quirv. This man was a Corellian pilot, way more outwardly powerful, physically strong and quick with a blaster, making him a great general in Jabba's private military forces. When Jabba's birthday came around, Bib Fortuna's gift was the Rancor, but the slug also liked Bidlow's present as well. The boss chose to use this event to decide who would become his right-hand man. He brought them both before the throne, and said that either of them could choose to be the Major Domo, or some other role that would be even greater, but which wasn't explained. Bib was cunning enough to see what was happening, and stepped forward, pleading to be given the honor of being the Major Domo of the great Jabba the Hutt. The pirate was willing to gamble on this other opportunity, saying that of course he wanted the job that would be even more rewarding. But this was a trick. Jabba wanted to see who was there for the riches, and who was there out of admiration and loyalty to the greatest of huts. For thinking that there could be a role greater than Jabba's major domo, he had Bidlow dropped into a pit, holding Fortuna's gift. He was the very first victim of the Rancor that would come to take an infamous, even legendary status within the underworld. Fortuna would then convince the most famous beast handlers in the galaxy, the human Malakili of the famous Circus Horrificus, to come take residency at the palace and care for the Rancor. With Fortuna's scheming, Jabba was able to secure the entire planet of Tatooine, with its hit pod racing course at Mos Espa, and an attraction under his feet that was sought out by the fight pits and circuses around the galaxy. But in a few years, Fortuna would face the most difficult fight of his life, as the Clone Wars erupted in 22 BBY, it would be the Major Domo's job to ensure that this hard-earned hut empire stayed intact, the massive militaries of the Republic and CIS pulling them in different directions. Dooku had Jabba's son Rhoda the Hutt kidnapped, and hoped to frame the Republic. This plan was foiled by the Jedi, and backfired on the Separatists. Now the most powerful hut, with the most cutthroat right-hand man, would ensure that no other hut family aligned with the group that had kidnapped Rhoda. Fortuna would host Jedi Knight Ishu Shanjan, where they discussed their shared goal of taking out the rival Borka the Hutt, who had made the terrible decision of aligning with the CIS. After providing the Jedi with some intel, Borka was gone. And next up was Torpo, a distant cousin of Jabba's who also had aligned with the enemy, allowing the Separatists to set up a mining operation inside of Hutt space. For this, he too would be eliminated. And while Bib was helping Jabba kill off his family, other Fortunas in the galaxy were also making moves. 
Ab Fortuna had become the major domo of Kratusk, the head of the Bounty Hunter Guild. And here we see a trait that Bib was soon to exhibit, as Ab was often trying to work with bounty hunters to kill his master, even reaching out to the Trandoshan's own son, Bosk. But for all this plotting, he would be hunted down and killed by Boba Fett. Beezer Fortuna was Bib's cousin, and he decided to turn his back on crime and fight for a larger purpose after surviving the CIS occupation of Ryloth. He joined the Republic and Jedi's efforts to liberate his homeworld, and would continue the fight for independence when the Republic became the Empire overnight. When these acts got him arrested, he came into contact with members of Saw Gerrera's partisans. And though Bib had a powerful position, this was not his ultimate life goal. He had wanted to be a crime boss since his teens, and now at his middle age, he vents his frustration to an ally in Jabba's palace, a crack in the facade of this cold, calculating majordomo, lashing out in anger and saying, quote, This creature, this heap of fat and entrails and low cunning, this thing has made a servant of me. Worse, a slave. He degrades me, abuses me, amuses himself by abasing me. Me, whose shadow he is not fit to touch. Jabba had no clue that Fortuna was harboring these feelings or scheming against him. And in 5 BBY, the Twi'lek actually aligned with six of Jabba's low-level thugs to capture palace guards and then torture Jabba with hopes of him giving up the location of his most secret hordes of credits, treasure, and information. Bib launched this plan one night, but as they moved to the throne room, two other assassins had unleashed creatures called Freckers. They were ravenous rodents that would claw and gnaw their way through organics, an excruciating and slow death for an enormous hut. Bib's allies sprung into action, but these Freckers were attacking everything in sight, bringing down Bib's would-be assassins and setting the whole palace on alert. As Fortuna watched as his recruits were getting killed off, he starts blasting away at the Freckers, and when the last of his allies was brought down, the thug looked up at him and started to utter about the plan, forcing Bib to pump a blaster bolt into the man. Looking back up to Jabba, seeming to have heroically rushed in to put down this coup. Jabba's faith in the Major Domo had never been greater, while internally Bib was fuming at this failed plot. Nonetheless, the slug's success was tied to his own, and he would serve expertly over the following years. He would uncover a Senac slaver that was trying to embed himself as a spy within the palace, and once this was confirmed, Fortuna ordered his execution. Then he even rooted out an ISB agent. These were the top spies of the Empire, the agents that were able to bring down countless rebel cells, and who had wormed their way into several rival crime organizations to run them as puppets. Fortuna's mind had been sharpened for almost half a century at this point, and he sniffed out the agent's bogus backstory from the first day he descended into the lair. After Fortuna got some one-on-one -on -one time to have some seemingly casual conversation about the life of a smuggler, his suspicions were confirmed, and he ordered the guards to drop the agent into the Rancor pit, his old birthday gift proving to be quite useful. Now in the year 4 ABY, Bib would run into Luke Skywalker outside of the palace by mere coincidence, or perhaps by intervention from the Force. Seeing this man who was once a lost, driven young boy, born into a crime family on a world which exported nothing but spice and slaves, Luke wanted to give him a chance at redemption. Skywalker had happened upon a slaver who had captured two girls, Ula and Sinra. The Jedi killed the slaver and freed Sinra, but Ula wanted to go to the palace, knowing its dangers and depravity, but feeling it was their best shot at a good life. Fortuna arrived to pick them up, and Luke pleaded with Bib to see the error in his ways, to come to realize how far he had been corrupted, buying up slaves of his own people to entertain an evil hut. And believe it or not, Fortuna actually considered turning his back on a life of crime. It had gotten him nothing so far. How long would it be before he finally scraped that slime off the throne? Would he ever be more than just the top servant? Perhaps the light side was trying to get in, but this moment was short. The reality of his decisions hardened his heart, and he turned his back on the robed human, taking Ula to the palace with him. It was only a few days after this that the droids R2-D2 and C-3PO showed up, ostensibly as gifts to his master. Me child is so good. He says that our instructions are to give it only to Jabba himself. Moments later, he would be shocked to see that this same Jedi was trying to free the scum Han Solo. When this request was denied, the palace went back to business as usual, and to distract himself from the specter of this Jedi and his own conscience, he took the pleasures of one of the dancers, the human Jess, whom he had captured during his slaver campaigns on his homeworld. During the festivities, the bounty hunter Baosh appeared with the captured Chewbacca. 
But the man that could sniff out ISB agents suspected that this was not merely great fortune that was giving Jabba Han and now his Wookiee best friend in such a short time. He peeled off and laid in wait with his master, springing the trap once Solo was thought out of Carbonite. The woman would be his master's new slave girl, and the two smugglers turned rebel allies were thrown into the dungeon, only for that pesky Jedi to reappear. Jabba gave clear orders to not admit Skywalker to the throne room, and Bib appears to have been under the spell of a Jedi mind trick. But knowing how calculating Fortuna is, I would not put it past him to roll the dice on this force wielder. Surely a stronger opponent to Jabba than any thugs he could muster, perhaps thinking this would lead him to securing the throne at last. Jabba would try to have the Jedi devoured by the Rancor, and in this gory spectacle, Luke would throw the skull of Fortuna's once rival, Bidlo, smashing the skull into the closing mechanism on the gate, killing the gift that had secured Bib's place as Major Domo all those years ago, and sending the galaxy's greatest beast handler of the Circus Horrificus, Malakili, into hysteria. Though in the end, this just made for a great show, as these three rebels were all rounded up and sentenced to death by Sarlacc. This would prove to be the day he had waited on for nearly four decades. And it should be noted that the thermal detonator brought in by the Bosch Pretender was taken by Bib, and he may have been the one to suggest the execution method that would take Jabba and his top guards far out away from the palace grounds. The Jedi's ally, a tiny female human he would come to learn was Leia Organa, strangled the slug to death with her own slave chains. And when the whole barge was in chaos, it suddenly burst into flames and explodes, perhaps the Major Domo put that thermal detonator to good use. Ensuring the death of his master, his top guards, and several rival claimants to the throne. Bib had also brought his own skiff, just more evidence that he intended Jabba to die this day and he would use this to race back to the palace. He was no warrior, but he was proficient enough with a blaster to cut down the opportunists blindly looting Jabba's riches, and he rallied up allies to finally take control of the entire palace complex after a short firefight. And here is where the tales differ. Legends say that Fortuna seamlessly took control of the Hutt's empire, having been the brains of the operation all along. And it was this brain that the Ba'omar monks sought out. The religious order had been the original builders of this palace, and their beliefs led them to move their brains into these nutrient jars atop spider legs, in hopes of cutting themselves off from the weakness of an organic body, finally being liberated of the need for fuel, sleep, sensations, or excretion, they could engage in pure abstract thought. One night, these terrifying cyborgs swarmed the new conqueror of their monastery, using their droid manipulators to cut through his skull, extract his brain, and transfer him into the mech suit for the brain jar. Roughly six months later, the imprisoned Bib summoned an old Twi'lek ally, Ferith Olan. He drew him to Tatooine with the promise of securing Jabba's treasures. Fortuna hoped to work with them in going through Jabba's intel, and use a trusted fellow Twi'lek with his full, normal body to be the face of the operation. But Olan was not going to listen to this cyborg spider, and force him to decode intel on abandoned Imperial sites. Olan was ecstatic at the discovery of at least 64 tie interceptors in a hidden base located deep inside of an ancient crate Dragon tunnel. This would be an incredible boon to any military, especially a crime lord in the tumultuous times of the Empire's fall. But Rogue Squadron was also on constant seek-and-destroy missions for exactly these types of Imperial leftovers. Most of these were destroyed by the X-Wings of the Alliance, but also by Imperial Remnant forces that were intent on preventing these powerful ties from falling into enemy hands. Olan fled with his cyborg captive to their homeworld of Ryloth, telling his old friend that it looked like his days as a slaver warlord would catch up to him. To save himself, Olan was fine with throwing Fortuna into the hands of the Ryloth authorities. But he underestimated this spider. Bib may just be a brain in a jar, but his mind was always his greatest weapon. Using the abilities of his new body, he was able to sneak away and into Wedge Antilles' ship, making the return flight to Tatooine. Imperial Remnant Captain Marl Sempton heard of Olan's actions with the Ties and hoped to utilize his underworld connections to grow his own Remnant forces, giving the Twi'lek control of Eidolon Base. Unfortunately for Olan, Rogue Squadron had identified this base as well, and when they attacked, the Imperial was disappointed to see how much of a coward this thug was. He could not let Olan live, stabbing him as the New Republic forces approached. The pathetic Twi'lek crawled off and tumbled down the side of a cliff, falling at the robotic legs of the disembodied Fortuna. As Olan lost consciousness, Bib was summoning droids and a transport, 
getting him back to the palace in time for the Baomar monks to perform a life-saving procedure. But the protocol droid there was confused by some of the scars, noting that this procedure didn't just involve the Bacta tank, but appeared to have signs of a brain transfer as well. The re-embodied Bib Fortuna wipes himself off as he looks down at the imprisoned brain of Olon, noting what a great suggestion it was to now place a restraining bolt on the spider droid body. Forcing him to follow behind him like a pet, Olon was under the complete control of his new master, who made his way directly to his throne, outsmarting the most powerful of huts and escaping a potentially timeless mental prison. Bib Fortuna would use these experiences to grow even stronger, taking the once hut-controlled enterprise to new heights, using the volatility of the war between the New Republic and Imperial Remnant to become a crime boss with more power than he could have ever dreamed of. And with this power, we learn that all along, he hoped to gain control of Jabba's empire in order to conquer all of Ryloth, to become the absolute ruler of the world that had outcast him all those decades ago. But he did not wish to crush his people under his Rancor leather boot. Rather, he hoped to free them from the dual tyrants of spice and slavery that have been the true oppressors of his people for millennia. He had been harboring visions of establishing enormous schools that would instill a martial ethic, sharpening the minds and bodies of the youth towards skills that would be highly valuable to the Empire. Specifically, he dreamed of a time where hearing the word Twi'lek did not conjure up visions of exotic dancing slaves or spiced-out smugglers, but rather the galaxy's best mercenaries and spies, something like a mix of Mandalorians and Bothans. It is interesting to consider that the name Bib Fortuna had become a curse word amongst his people of Ryloth remembering the infamous warlord that had captured seven cities on his slave raids. But in his mind, he was just doing what was necessary to put the enormous power of the Huts into the hands of a Twi'lek. They had been enslaved for thousands of years before he came along. Perhaps he rationalized it as he wasn't creating any sort of new evil, but he did create the new potential of finally freeing his people and turning his species into one honored and respected throughout the galaxy. Now as for canon, the rise of Fortuna is nearly identical, even down to the rivalry with Bildo and the gift of the pet Rancor Patissa and Bidlo being eaten. Around 0 ABY, he would take part in the mercenary war on Tatooine with Sapanza. Jabba do hot do bunky dunko, mamasta masa upa doce stupa. The events of Jabba's death are similar, with it being unclear if Bibbs set the sail barge to blow but he definitely seized the opportunity to grab the throne, where he would spend the next five years living out his dream of being a powerful crime boss. Until in 9 ABY, when an old associate returned to the palace. Even though he watched the bounty hunter Boba Fett fall into the Sarlacc pit that fateful day, he watched in horror and confusion as that son of a clone blasted away his palace guards and made his way to the throne room. Uh, uh, Boba! Uh, but Jabba's old associate was not here to catch up on lost time, blasting the tailhead and placing himself upon the throne. After all those years of scheming, his life was snuffed out in an instant. Keep in mind that Boba felt like Jabba's palace was the only place he could call home after the abrupt and traumatic end to his father's life, where the young boy had to flee Kamino and go to the only place Jango said was safe in case of emergency. Jabba the Hutt was the only one who showed the boy kindness in this tumultuous time, honoring the alliance he had built with Jango. So even if he couldn't be sure, Boba's lifetime of working with cutthroats like Bib Fortuna would have left him suspicious about the Major Domo's intentions, a betrayal that Boba was happy to avenge. That's it for his life story, and as for some behind the scenes facts, almost his entire wardrobe from the gloves to cloak are made from Jalavash warm silk, a worm that is native to Ryloth. He also had incredibly soft-soled shoes that allowed him to move through the halls of the palace akin to a ghost, spying on everyone and everything that passed through the doors. Also within his cloak, he always had his poison dagger on him at all times, often right alongside his trusty blaster pistol. Bib most likely did not know this, but he was not the first Fortuna to arrive on Tatooine. Comad Fortuna was there around 3,986 BBY, and he was a big game hunter that was known to have taken down at least one crate dragon, using traditional methods that earned him even the respect of Tusken Raiders. The planet Eden II had a Fortuna city, but it is unclear which Fortuna this place is named after, and the name Fortuna means fortune in Latin. The actor that played Bib in Episode 1 was Matthew Wood, and he would reprise his role about 20 years later in The Mandalorian. 
In the early scripts for Return of the Jedi, he was referred to as the High Beezer of Hoth, with sketches looking like an old human wizard. And that's where we get the name Beezer Fortuna from Rogue One. The creature that he became took eight hours to get the makeup at first, but over the five weeks of shooting, they were able to get it down to around 58 minutes, as well as taking 25 minutes to get off. He was played by Michael Carter and voiced by Eric Barsfeld, who was also the voice for Admiral Akbar. So that's it for the complete life of Bib Fortuna. Thanks for watching to the end. You guys are the real meta nerds out there. Um, if you want to help promote the video, please hit the like button and comment something down below. All of that helps to promote the video here on YouTube, show it off to new people that might like it, uh, and tell me what you think about his life. I never realized how complicated Bib's life was until I made this video, how he might have been actually trying to save his species, lift them up out of slavery and spice addiction, all that kind of stuff, by taking over the criminal empire. All really complicated stuff, but he may have just made that up after the fact. Maybe he was starting to feel bad about everything in his older age. Comment down below, let me know what you think about it. Uh, if you want to help support us even further, please check out all the links down in the description. Whether it's to watch some species videos, some ship videos, we've got tons of playlists. Uh, you can also pick up really cool affiliate stuff, uh, some cool Star Wars metal print art, free audiobooks from Audible. It can be anything, but they got tons of great Star Wars books too. Amazon links that shoot us a commission without any extra cost to you. And ways to support us over on PayPal or Patreon. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, especially our $25 tier, Chris Garcia, Cass Costello, C7Go, and Matthew Beltrami. But most important of all, remember, if a spice-addled slaver warlord's ideas are more proactive and productive than your government's, you might be a Twi'lek, and the Force will be with you, always.